President Trump condemned white supremacy following this weekend's back-to-back -back mass shootings. Critics say, though, it's too little too late. In El Paso, Texas, the accused gun gunman posted a manifesto before the shooting, which echoed the president's rhetoric on immigration, along with other figures on the right. There's a new Axis article titled The Era of White Nationalism, and it talks about the growing danger. Sarah Fisher is a meter reporter for Axios, and she joins us now to talk about the piece she's just written. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you call this the era of white nationalism. Explain. I think we've had white nationalism in our country for a long time. We've seen divisive behavior, examples of it. We note in the article that the Department of Homeland Security warned about this in 2009, 10 years ago. But the reason that we say this is the era of white nationalism is because the country is unified in actually calling it that and labeling it that. You saw in response to the shootings this weekend that Republicans were starting to call this out and saying, this is an example of white nationalism. Mm -hmm. You're seeing it obviously from the left as well. You're even seeing prominent me members of the media who have traditionally stepped away from completely going into those topics embracing the topic because we have to own it now. Mm. It's part of our identity now. And that is something I don't think America has ever truly, truly grappled with. And in fact, you write that uh, racial resentment and anxiety uh, have been a central appeal for the president. Explain that and explain how it relates, because it's one thing to white supremacy is one thing, but then to elevate it to the level of violence. I shouldn't say elevate it, but for it to evolve to the level of violence. It's completely correct what you're saying. I think when we talk about the Trump campaign, I, I'm an advertising and media reporter. I look at ads all the time. Donald Trump will put tons of ads out there that are utilizing language such as invasions when he's talking about minority populations. Mm -hmm. He'll run ads talking about the controversy in Baltimore, stirring the controversy that already exists. Mm -hmm. When we all kind of know that's a manufactured crisis to target a minority lawmaker. Mm -hmm. And so he's been using these types of incidents strategically to drum up his base. And I got to say, he wouldn't be doing this if he didn't think it was working. And that's why I say this is the era of white nationalism. We all have to recognize that for a population in our country, this type of language is working. And it's working so well that not only did it get someone elected potentially, but it might help potentially get someone elected again. I think what you're bringing up is a really good point that, you know, for, for you and I, Vlad, chances are we see the president's tweets. But there are a group of people that are specifically targeted for these ads that we will never see. Right. Right. But she gets to see them all. So she knows some of the messaging that we don't even we don't even know how extreme it gets. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. People see and you can see it through his publicly facing Twitter handle as well. It's not all just what we call dark ads, which mm -hmm. are ads that aren't targeted towards you. I mean, he uses tons of language that people take issue with. I also think look at the way he's talked about white nationalism in the wake of Charlottesville. He came out and said that there are issues on both sides. Right. Of course, that became a national headline because that is sort of, you know, excusing what happened mm -hmm. uh, as being a valid p opinion or way of thought. And so I think moving forward now that Members of both parties, more people from the media are taking a stand and saying, we own this identity. Now we have to confront it. I would expect to see some more outcry when mm -hmm. things like this happen. So what's interesting, too, Sarah, is you point out in your piece and what you just said here is that for years this has existed since the founding of the country, essentially. Um, but that for a long time, politicians refused to acknowledge it with the nomenclature, the terminology that is being used today. And yet when you look at the language, the language of invasion, infestation, um, th that mimics the kinds of things that we saw, for example, Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, used a very similar language to describe uh, Jewish people um, across Europe. And I wonder if people who define the word invasion and say the president isn't being racist when he uses the word invasion. He's talking about literally a large number of people coming into this country. Are they really that obtuse that they don't understand what kind of signals it sends? Because it's clear that the way that ads are created, they get that. Yeah, they I, get how the language is being used. I don't think that they're that obtuse. I think everyone here understands the underlying tone of why it matters, why we have to be choosy with our language. And that's why I'm saying coming out now and saying that we have a white nationalism problem is specific language that we're using there. We're going there. It used to be when you look at the DHS's memo from 2009, they called it far right extremism. They didn't go so far as to say that this is a white nationalism problem. Mm. But now, if you take a look at the FBI's warnings about domestic terrorism, they are using words like white nationalism. Mm. So I think that we're coming to terms by using more extreme language or identifying when others are using extreme language that it's not okay, because we're coming into a moment 
in a way that we have never really done as a society. So you have another article that sort of this is part of the whole same conversation. It's about misinformation in the 2020 primaries. And one of the things that I really like about your writing is that you don't just explain what's happening, but you give specific examples because on the Internet, it can be very confusing. Uh, it's it's designed to be confusing and misleading. And so you think you're getting legitimate news and it's not. So I want you to talk about some of the misleading tactics and give us some examples. Yes, so when we talk about misinformation, it's always existed since the era of the printing press. But what I wanted to do with this article is take a look at how it's changed from 2016 to 2020. And here's what we found. One, bots are way smarter and more sophisticated. They're using human-like tactics in order to go without being detected so that Google, Facebook, Twitter, doesn't knock them off their platforms. Mm -hmm. Another example is that they're going after people with really large followings so that if they can implant some sort of conspiracy theory with them and they can blow it up to millions of people and then it gets maybe onto network news, they can just sort of blow it up. They can light the match and let the flame go. Uh, another big example of something that we saw is that they are really going after candidates' backgrounds. Why? A lot of these newer candidates aren't vetted. I mean, they were going after Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg. These are people who, unlike Joe Biden, don't have you know years and years and years of presidential experience vetted to go after. So they're using something that's already questionable as is. Yeah. Uh, so all these tactics are things that maybe they've existed in the past, but they're really prevalent leading up to 2020. So, I mean, and I, they, these two pieces that you've written sort of dovetail uh, with each other, in my mind, because we're talking about the misinformation, um, and then we're talking about the language that has been used to describe um, people that are not white. And I wonder, it was surprising to me, and I've been saying this for the last two days, that it was just shocking to me. We had um, John Miller here, the counterintelligence uh, police commissioner of the NYPD, New York Police Department here, and he made a point on CBS This Morning where he said that the United States has never actually designated any domestic terrorist group um, a terrorist organization and I said incredulously to him well, what about the KKK for example and he said nope never called them a domestic terrorist group even though they were responsible for killing hundreds of our fellow citizens um, and so I was sort of taken aback by that and now you point to your article the, the previous article we were referencing that the FBI is, is now identifying mm -hmm. homegrown terrorism mm -hmm. and they've devoted resources to it but unless they get that de designation it's going to be harder to fight it as this continues to mushroom as this continues to balloon. Yeah I completely agree with that and I think that when you're talking about members of the government um, that's one institution that needs to actually lean into this. The media is another. Mm. If you take a look at news I've written about media bias. There's so much media attention to, you know, um, an IED going off in Afghanistan and killing a few soldiers. Um, but it took a long time for us to be putting the same kind of attention towards certain shootings. You know, it wasn't until we started to get these mass, mass shootings where there were dozens of people that were uh, being killed where we started to think about, wow, who is causing those shootings? Is there an underlying pattern amongst those people? Now that we've been through so many, we actually have data. We can say, yeah, there is an underlying pattern amongst these people. Many of them are far-right extremists. And, you know, the, the, the one thing I'll point out, because you cover media, is I get a lot of people who are either bots or right-wingers on my social media, and they'll say, using the definition of what a mass shooting is, let's look at people who have shot others in, for example, Chicago and urban areas, and then they'll send me a picture showing a bunch of African Americans mm -hmm. and saying, well, these are mass shooters. They are not these angry young white men that the media is out there perpetrating because of the left-wing media bias. And I, you can see how you can take anything and twist it for your own purpose to tell a narrative or to share a narrative that is not necessarily the full story. Yes, there's one commonality between the media, uh, the shootings that you're seeing that are sort of the right-wing extremists versus the others that were referencing your timeline, which is that the former has people who intentionally want to create viral moments. They leave manifestos online, they put them in places like 8chan, or 4chan so that they can go viral. They talk to people, they leave notes. These are people who want to create a moment of hate. And I think a lot of the crime that was referenced to you in your timeline is more personal one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I have an issue with this person right. and that's why you're having a lot of these shootings go down. Right. It is not a target of hate. It's a target of a personal crime. And to conflate the two is completely dangerous because then you would be losing out on the perspective of this is a moment where you know we need to be kind of harnessing as a nation as being a potential domestic terrorism threat. Yeah, really Sarah fascinating. Fisher. Yeah, always great to have Love you. Love having you in New York, Sarah. Yeah, but it's great so when much. we talk to you in DC as well. Mm -hmm. Love your reporting. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having me.